Right. Ash here. Tonight's a big night. We're coming to you with the manifesto of power. Sherry, I see you. get all my info in here. It's good to see everybody tonight. Just come in here and share it with, with a friend. Alexa, stop music. It's good to see everybody in here tonight. We're coming in. I'm going to give you guys some time to come in because what I got there with you, I know I didn't, I didn't promote the show. I see you, so you waving at me, Sherry. Thank you for coming. Susan McDonald, all these individuals who I'm trying to invite in, trying to invite you in, trying to invite you in, uh -huh. trying to invite you in. Uh, this is what we got here. So tonight we're going to be having a conversation <clears throat> about uh, some things that a lot of people just don't know about. And, you know, a, a lot of you you know, we started, I started doing the show. I started doing the show with my sister and whatnot. And maybe you thought it was just going to be some kind of uh, dating show only, but I'm too smart to have, to be a one topic individual. There's too much to talk about. I've got too much intelligence to just simply be telling you how to get a man or how to keep a man or how to get a woman in your life. Like there's much more to life than that. And uh, I have to tell you some things that are, are, are incredibly important um to what we call civilization and society i can't just sit here being a one topic dude that don't make no doggone sense so um again i'm going to share it i'm going to i'm hoping anybody who wants to come in can come in and anybody who'd like to have a conversation once the show starts we can we can definitely have that conversation um before we get started i'm going to tell you about the 29th of june we're having our single soiree on the 29th of June. It's going to be fantastic. Hoping to see many of you coming out here and hanging out on the 29th of June down at 1150 Queen Street West. Um, it is the Drake Hotel, and it's going to be fantastic. The single soiree uh, is where we put together um, an event uh, for singles in Toronto and the GTA we're also going to be launching a, uh, uh, it's going to be a release party for the launch of Exibi's um, new single and his, his up and coming album. Also our DJ, Jefe Calderon, he's an artist also. We're going to be hearing from him and I might have another guest artist. So it's going to be some great artists, wonderful DJ. We're going to have food. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be some uh, a place that many people are going to talk about and say, hey, man, you should have come out. Um, it's not going to be a one-time event. But every event's going to be different. So you missed this event. You've missed a lot. Okay. So in saying that, <clears throat> we can move right along into, into the scenario. You know, I hope you guys had an amazing weekend. I had an amazing Father's Day. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm rocking my dad cup tonight. Mm -hmm. With dad juice in it. It's none of your business. But it is, it is our sponsor who's not a sponsor. And uh, keep coming all the way. <clears throat> my friend got me this Bouliot Bourbon alright Bouliot Bourbon our sponsor cursing Sherry um, but <laughs> Bouliot Bourbon is our sponsor tonight and of course Raspberry Danish is always a sponsor of my life my soulmate mm -hmm. now what do I want to talk to you guys about tonight tonight's a serious conversation because you should understand that living in this country, I don't sure I got that in there. Living in this country and North America, that there are some serious things that you guys don't recognize about your privilege and your power. And some communities love to talk about white privilege, uh, but there is more than white privilege that exists. 
And um, that privilege, I would call it Western privilege. And Western privilege for us at this current time, a lot of you don't understand where, you're, where you are, what you, what you have access to, um, and, and advantages of and other, other people in, in, in the world. The two major things that make up Western privilege is um, number one, your capacity to create an honor system called credit. You have no idea the power that a society that can create an honor system called credit has over the rest of the world. Um, I'm speaking of Ghana, West Africa, about this particular scenario. And then I'm going to talk about the ability to organize your workforce and incentivize your workforce. So that's the two major things that you have here in the West. The honor system that has been created in the, in the financial area and the capacity to organize and incentivize your workforce. I mean, those are your two, that's your left hand and your right hand. And let me break them down. It, West Africa, the type of credit that you guys have here doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And I'm not talking about a, a country like Ghana is a first world country. Um, you have no advantage over Africa in the West. You have no advantage. You have no technological advantage. You don't have a, an advantage. Your doctors aren't better. Your lawyers aren't better. Your philosophers are not better. There's no advantage. Your politicians are not better. Okay. There's nothing that you have an advantage of in the West over Africa, especially a first world nation like Ghana. You're not more organized. Okay. There's nothing that you have that outmeasures Ghana. You don't have more natural resources, of course. Okay. You're not as rich. You're not. You're just, you're simply not as rich. You're just using the riches from years ago and you're using the a, a particular power that I'll talk about tonight when I talk about our, our the the order of the strong and our 10 laws, our 10 laws of power. But you don't have an advantage over Africa. What you have done is you have created specific privileges that make the West extremely attractive. Okay, and this is this would also include Europe. So the Western mindset, very attractive. And number one is the honor system that you have created with credit. Now imagine we are here in Canada and it's probably happening in America at this, at this time. And it's a current conversation that people are very um, motivated to talk about. And the two things I want to talk about is the is the is the decreasing of your charter of rights. Your rights are, are leaving you very quickly in this in North America. But the second thing that people are talking about today is the increase of interest rates, right? And it's really a hilarious conversation when from my brain, from my brain, it's really funny because in the West, because the privilege is so high, when governmental organizations decide to manipulate their fiat currencies, their fake systems of mon there's fake monetary system that you exist within. And they decide to manipulate that with interest rates. And people in the West, in the in the positions of privilege, they lose their mind, right? And they start to they start to complain and they start to get worried and they start to get anxious and all these things. But let me break down what, what is actually happening. So you are living in a scenario where you can borrow millions of dollars or at least hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy property that you can't afford. You can't afford it. You think in West Africa, a man can just simply say, I want to build a million dollar house or buy a million dollar house and have one tenth of the money, or in some cases, 5% of the money and go to a bank and say, hey, I have 5% of the money to buy something, could you lend me the 95%? Do you know the risk factor that is taken on by any lender who is lending you 90%, 95%, forget about 75%, lending you 75% of the money <clears throat> to buy something that you can't afford? <laughs> and so in the West, that is commonplace to us. That is an easy conversation. Of course, you're supposed to lend me the money. I don't have to have all of it. I only have to have a small portion of it. 
And then you're going to give me the rest so that I can go live in what I deserve. I deserve to be in that million dollar house. And let me tell you something. The average price of houses, and people think the average price of houses in Toronto is a million. It's not a million anymore. It's maybe two and a half million. That's the average price of a house you actually want to live in. The average price of a house at a million dollars is a house you don't want to live in. <clears throat> maybe a condo, and but but you might not even want to live in the condo that's worth a million dollars now. It's not much of a house. It's not much of a property. So this has now gotten bigger. You are saying, I deserve to live in a $1.5 or $2 million home that I don't have the money for. I've never saved that much money. I don't have it, but I'll work it off. And so you're living in this, in this bizarre world where you could actually look at something you can't afford and say, I can afford it. And you can boast in it. You can get into it and say, yeah, I just bought my new house and I'm here in my new home, you know, pride of ownership. And you start doing all those things, but you owe 90% of the money, 70% of the money to a financial institution that loaned you that money and said, hey, we, we trust you. <laughs> we, I mean, of course, we go through the process of, of qualifications, but at the end of the day, when you boil it down to the very bare bones, you have a financial institution that looked at you and said, and not just looked at you, looked at most Canadians, looked at most Americans and said, yeah, we trust you. We trust you. We, we trust you're going to pay us eventually. But what we're going to do, because we also trust you, we're going to build, build in a mechanism to make sure that we're making money by trusting you. It's called interest. And so we lose our mind when it's like, wait a minute, you actually want to charge me more money, more interest for loaning me 75, 85, 90% of, of, of the money to buy something I can't afford? How dare you? <laughs> the crazy thought process of that to an African mentality. The second point is the incentivizing of your workforce. Imagine an African woman thinking to herself, I can have a baby and I can go and live in my home for two years, raise my baby, take care of my baby for two years, for two years, for 24 months, for two years, and my job and, and, and government assistance combined will continue to pay me. That's amazing. That is amazing to have those types of abilities to do things like that. But do you think that that's commonplace? That's not commonplace. Those are societies that have structured themselves to incentivize their, their members, their constituents, their citizens. And some African countries do it, but they, they're probably countries you don't want to live in, right? They're probably countries, some African countries do some heck of a lot of things, but, you, but you, you're adverse to dictatorship in the West, all right? You don't want... Watch this, you want all the privileges, all the rights, and, want, and, and all the advantages, and you don't want anybody to tell you how to live. What a privileged culture you have. If I was a dictator and I ran a nation and the Western mentality of of, of entitlement were, was part of the mentality of the people who were part of the people that I oversaw as their dictator. I would be a magnanimous dictator. You have to eat. You have to live well. Of course, of course. You have, you'd like to drive that nice car. Okay. You know what I'm going to do for all of you? I'm going to let you have it. Absolutely. But I own you. <laughs> right? I own you. How big a house do you want? You want a house that big? No problem. I'm going to need uh, your first two children to, to, do, to do my... Um, they're they're going to come and they're going to work for me. They're gonna, I'm going to own them. Yeah, yeah. You might have a Tesla? Oh, I'm going to need a couple of daughters to take... Yeah, I'm going to need your parents to daughter you as a serf, right? The, the old feudal landlord system where 
you are now indebted to the king or to the Lord or to the sovereign because of the privilege they afford you. They're letting you, they're letting you squat on their land and 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 farm the land. And you know, half of that crops, you just bring it over to me. I'm gonna let you live there for free now. You're a sharecropper. But you bring me over the crops. And if I need to go to war, I'm gonna have to take one of your sons. And if I need something to deal with our house, or a, I'm gonna have to take a couple of your daughters. And that's how that's really how that would work. But imagine now in the Western civilization, you have the capacity to go to the, the people that have formed a nation and say, I deserve this. I, I, I've earned my right, especially in a country like Canada, like a Canadian country. Canada doesn't have an army. So I would understand Israel, even America and other countries where, you know, you're allowed to, you, you go out there and you fight for your country. You have to, everybody has to fight for the country and you come back. You'd be able to say, hey, listen, I sp spilled blood. I risked my life for this country. I, I believe I'm entitled to something, but Canada, you don't have to do that here. Canadians are entitled simply because they're entitled. And they feel that anything that they desire should be theirs, but they don't think about the, the privilege of the West. They don't think about it. And at the very same time, at the very same time, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of Trudeau. I'm not a big fan of Trudeau. But I will call out things that he's done right. Now, how he took care of the nation when the, when when they were they were under the new COVID nineteen scenarios and and he broke out the pocketbook. Oh yeah, everybody everybody was eating off of Trudeau. Trudeau was giving out two thousand dollars here, two thousand dollars there. People were being fed. The the the, the store stayed open. Because of the second thing, the the entitlement on and the the incentivizing of the workforce. Oh man, we gotta keep we gotta keep Canadians working. We gotta we gotta keep giving out money. We they kept the liquor open. They kept because they wanted you guys to feel good. They kept you being able to smoke weed. They they kept some entertainment things open. They they make sure that you could walk out of the bar with alcohol. They they made sure they gave the Westerner what they were used to, the accoutrements of privilege and comfort, give them their weed, give them their alcohol, let, let them let them be entertained, give them free money, because this, this pandemic is gonna, is gonna overturn the mentality that we have trained them to have. But you guys have, have sat, you sat there and you allowed it, you allowed yourself to suck on the breast of government, you allowed yourself to walk up and to collect collect millions of dollars to buy houses and 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 stores and and commercial um buildings that you can't afford you've you've allowed yourself to live in this level of lavish and you think it's you think it's normal you think it's you think you're privileged to do so but when they turn around now which is what's happening this is what you're seeing and they're saying we're going to shrink your rights you call murder Never before have has Canadians been subject to the uh, infringement of their rights like now. Never before have North Americans, even in America, you don't have rights like you used to have, right? Your grandfather and your grandmama, even living post um, or, or, or almost pre-civil rights, had more privacy than you guys have right now. You don't have privacy now. This this I have things in my home that are listening to me. I have things in my house that are they're listening to me. Alexa, resume music. I have things in my house listening to me. Alexa, stop music. You think Alexa's just listening to my voice? Alexa's, you have things in your home that are recording you all the time. You you drive through a traffic light, you're being recorded. You you, you some of you um uh, submitted yourself to, to to being to being traceable when COVID was happening. You're, you're, you're driving vehicles that any given anybody can find you. You have side in the sky that can pinpoint your face. You have no privacy anymore. You've given that up. You've given it up for technology. You've given it up for access to the to the World Wide Web. You've given it up for Instagram and for Facebook. You've given those things up. You've given them up for Tesla. You've given those things up. You don't have rights like you thought you used to have rights. Your rights don't exist like that anymore. And so... 
This whole world order that everybody's afraid of, oh, the George Soros world order, it's not his world order. You've given them the world order. You've allowed them to do this to you. You've allowed it. You sat there begging, begging for vaccines, running. Why can't I be vaccinated? Why can't I be vaccinated? You took your children, your grandmothers, your uncles, your aunties. You ran to be vaccinated. You, you couldn't wait. You stood in lines to be vaccinated. You complained that there was a, a system of vaccination and you weren't getting yours fast enough. All of you wanted it. And now you're screaming, saying, when will they, when will they let us out of the country? They've, they've trapped us in our country. <laughs> they didn't drag you and force you like they did in China to be vaccinated. You ran to be vaccinated. You ran. You put masks on your face and, and, and walked the streets thinking that the air in itself was poison. And to some of you, it was. Some of you, it was very poison. Some, a lot of people died because the pandemic was real. It was a real disease. It wasn't as serious as they said it was, but it was definitely a real disease. But now you want to be free. I don't want... I don't want mandates. I don't want mandates anymore. I'm, I'm tired of the mandates. They close the borders. And this is what governments do and, and leaders do to test you. They want to see how much pressure they can put on you before you break. Because, wow, can how far can we drive up the price of gas before everybody just says, I'm taking the gas? How, how, how much can we shut down the country before people say, I'm storming Ottawa and I'm shutting down the capital of this nation? That's what, this is the point, that there is an order of the strong and you're not part of it, most of you. You're subject to it. And tonight I'm going to teach you how to change that. No society has been created by the weak. There has never been a society that has been created by the weak amidst that society. Even in a weak society, the stronger of the weak create society. A coalition of the strong, they're unified and they make decisions and they create civilization by their metric, by their choosing, by their ideas, by their ideologies, by their conscience, by their insecurities. They create it and they tell you how to live in it. In ancient culture, there was a king by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, an ancient king. And there was a civil war in his country. And the nation was split into two. And he c collected approximately 85% of the followers of the nation followed him. And 20 or 15 or so percent followed the other king. The country was split into two. And so what Jeroboam realized <clears throat> was that if his, the problem was his people, it was, and it was a very religious nation, the nation was Israel, but his people and his area were not the people that were following the system of religion. And he thought to himself, if my people, the 85%, he got most of them, he got 10 tribes to follow him out of the 12. And he said to himself, if I don't create a new system of religion, even these will begin to follow the other guy. And so what he realized that he needed to do, and I'll start there, even though it's not in the order that I have, the first order of the strong and the first manifesto of power of ancient civilizations, modern civilizations don't use it as the same way, but I'll talk about it, is the rule of religion. And I can, I can call it <clears throat> the rule of ideology. There is nothing more powerful than an idea an idea that can pierce through the minds of the few who are influencers 
and become contagious to the masses becomes bigger than an idea, it becomes an ideology because it is an idea that teaches. It teaches everyone to think like that. And if you can control thought, and the best way to control, control thought is through religion, especially religion that's not real. You have now the capacity to pull on the conscience and the, the ethical fibers of a community. Remember when COVID hit, you were considered to be um, not a good citizen by Pierre Elliott Trudeau. You were not good. You were not a good citizen if you did not get vaccinated. In fact, you know, he said, no one in this country that chooses not to be vaccinated will ride on any of our transportation systems. You won't be on a train. You won't be on a bus. You won't be on a plane, right? Right now, people who are trying to get um, green cards to the United States of America, you're trying to get a green card in the United States of America. You know what you need to show? You need to show that you're vaccinated. They're like, you won't even be able to be to be a resident of this country unless you allow us to inject you with that vaccination. It's an ideology. And for a period of time, vaccines was the biggest religion this world had. They were shutting down churches, weren't they? They were shutting, they told churches, you can't gather. You sorry, pastors, religious leaders, said, I will listen to the government before I listen to God and I will shut my church down, my place of faith, my place of worship because the government, because Rob Ford here, our premier, our governor, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, our prime minister, like our president, those dictators said, shut down the houses of worship because we have given you a new ideology and that ideology is is, is is the rule of vaccination, the pandemic, is the rule of law. And you guys shut down. So let me tell you something. You cannot create a civilization without the rule of religion, without the rule of ideology. You can't create a civilization without that. That is part of the manifesto of power that you need everybody as much as possible to have the, you have, you have to have the capacity to pull on the heartstrings of their conscience and their ethical fibers. This is why in the West, they have stopped caring about what religion it is. They don't care what religion it is because as long as they can say two things, that what kind of religion is it? Does it have a religion that allows you to have a conscience? Yes. Uh, does it have ethics that we can, that we can utilize if we want to control people? Yes. That can be a good religion. And then even if that religion doesn't have that, they can say the only thing that trumps your religion is martial law. An emergency, state of emergency trumps your religion. We declare a state of emergency in Ontario. Churches must be shut down. You good Canadians, you go up to your houses of worship and you close them up. You say, sorry, the government said we got to close. Um, God, we got to close. The government said we got to close. <laughs> Right. The only thing that has trumped that in North America has trumped the rule of religion is the rule of government. But it's an ideology. And many of you believe that religion and, and government operate on the same field. It is somebody bigger than you telling you how to live. Right. The second rule is has to be the rule of law. And this is we talk about this. Civilizations operate under the rule of law. They, the rule of religion used to be the rule of law. But then when people moved away from religion, they wanted something secular. That, did, that was more tangible and that they could create. And, they, and so we came up with the rule of law, right? The manifesto. Now, who creates the law controls a society. Who creates the law controls a society. This is why people who talk, people from marginalized groups who say things to me like, oh, I don't vote. Oh, I don't, I don't care about voting. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. That's why you will always be a slave. You are created to be a serf. You're created to be an individual that can be used. And, and you are the people with the greatest levels of entitlement because you don't care about the rule of law. 
but you, you scream and holler and say, oh, the laws are unfair to me, right? You hold marches and, and when people shoot people in your demographic, you, you want to speak, you want to have the most to say, but your voting record is silent. You don't, you don't organize members of your constituency, your ethnic groups, of, or, or your, your, your locals to go out there and say, hey, 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 we're going to form our own situation. We're going to make sure that you get in there so you can take care of us because you don't understand the second rule, the second manifesto of power is the rule of law. You can create the law, and the law works only for you. We know this. We, I know this. Uh, black people know this better than anybody. Okay? Black, or you had black only water fountains and white only water fountains. And you think those people didn't know that there was no difference between that water? No, they had to make you realize, they had to make you understand you have a place. We're creating a rule of law to make sure that you always recognize you have a place and your place is below us. So you can't you can't enter the elevator. I don't care if you're Sammy Davis. I don't care. I don't care if you're if you're Lou Rawls, Ray Charles. I don't care if you're Beyonce. If, if Beyonce was a, was back in the 40s and the 50s, you can't you can't enter this elevator. You gotta. I don't care if you're if you're if you're performing. I don't care if your name is on the building that you've come here to entertain me. You've got to enter through the servants' quarters because you are from that other group that we're telling we control you. We're going to give you names. We're going to call you that. All of us are going to call you that. And when we call it to you, you better accept that's who you are because we're going to put you in a position to speak to you a certain way. And you can't do anything about it because the rule of law says you can't look at us in our face. The rule of law says you can't talk back to us. The rule of law says you can't strike us. You can't hit us. The rule of law says I can strike you. I can hit you. I can do anything I want to you because the rule of law was created by me. And if you do not control laws, that society at one time in your future will turn on you and take away everything you, everything you think you own, you don't own. You don't own your house. If the rule of law has been created by others who can say, oh, um, uh, what, what, what do they call that? They call it uh, when the government has the capacity to just decide that, oh, you know what? Um, it's at the, tip of my, at the tip of my tongue. We're going to take all this land. This land is now government land. We're going to need it for infrastructure building. They, they can just arbitrarily decide to take your land, to take your stuff away from you, right? They, they stop with that that frontier scenario and waited for everybody to sell out. No, no, no. We declare that this area is required we're, and, and we're just going to, you can, you can take market value or we can just take the property. So things of rule of law allows people in control to take your stuff. This is why you must be conspicuous in the laws of your country. We have a, I have a scenario at my school. Where the the prince the uh, principal has been has been changed, and he's been changed for a very specific reason, very easy reason, because the trustee likes him, the trustee has a school she likes, and the trustee has decided this principal will be in that school, and she snaps her fingers and has moved him, moved she she has disrupted a whole school system, because she simply has the power of law, she's got the power of position, the power of government. She's an elected official with the omnipotent power to simply say. You will no longer work for them. You're going to work for these guys. I'm going to still take care of you, but I can just switch you up. I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care about your family. I don't care about your logistics. I don't care what's going on. I control the rule of law. And we know that works on a multiple amount of levels. I won't stay there, but I can, I can continue with that. The rule of law is something that you must be deeply, you must be knee deep in it, constructing laws. That means that people in your, with, who think like you have to be Mayors, councillors, municipal level have to be ministers of parliament, senators, right? Federal and, and provincial or state levels. You have to make sure that your voice is, is heard. That's, that's why these guys, that's why big business gives these guys money. They give everybody money. They don't pick their own guy. They say, listen, I want to control all of you. I want to make sure all of you do what I need you to do. Because after the rule of law, is the rule of, is, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to add this one actually. No, it's, it's there already, but it's the rule of wealth. I was going to call it the rule of money, but it's already here. 
the rule of wealth. The guy with the biggest gun really controls everything. But the guy with the biggest pocketbook can control the guy with the gun. Yeah. The guy with the gun. My battery's running low. I got to plug myself in. Hold on a second. The guy with the gun really controls everything. But the guy with the biggest pocketbook. Hold on. That guy controls the guy with the gun. It's called the rule of wealth. Or you can also call it the rule of money. You can also call it the rule of money if you want to, but I call it the rule of wealth. Wealth can override law. Can. Wealth can override law. It can also affect religion. It can affect religion. It can put religion in a position where it closes an eye. Right? It has a sympathetic stance to something that is taking place. Redirect religion. Sometimes. But it can definitely affect the rule of law. Why do you think that individuals who have already achieved their, their financial scenario, they're stable, they're financially stable, they now want to become lawmakers? Does that make does it, doesn't make sense, right? You're, you're a billionaire, Donald Trump. Now you want to be a president, but you don't make no money doing a president. That don't make no sense. You make, I thought you were making billions. So why would you want to take a job that pays hundreds of thousands? The rule of wealth. Because the rule of wealth <clears throat> has the capacity to structure society in the way that it wants. And the presidency of the United States, and, and Trump showed it very well, if you slip into the, the, the scenario of the rule of law for a minute and you start building laws that will help you, when you slip out of government and you go back into your dominant area of the rule of wealth, everything becomes easier. They can open up doors. They can, they can, they can have, give you government contracts, right? They can give you bailouts. They can give you tax incentives. They can take bylaws out of the way. Oh, you got to pay millions of dollars of bylaw to put up that condo? Don't worry about that. Just give me a couple free condos. They can change everything omnipotently by a little bit of money being applied to the, to the lawgivers, to the lawmakers, and things can be drastically changed. The rule. So, so now this is the, the problem, and and, I'm, and I have ten of these. I've only gone through three or four, but rule of religion, rule of law, and rule of wealth. Three. Um, most people can't really mess with those three. Those three are hard, right? Most of you aren't priests, and are, and if you are religious or or could have some religious control, I see my brother, my brother, Father Samuel here, the the, the black Orthodox priest. Of America. If you got power, you don't have enough power necessarily to have national effect. Right? God bless y'all. You don't have enough power to have national effect. So you in 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 religious, in the rule of religion, the rule of religion really only works if you have a big religious order that controls thought. Right? I, I'll give you an example, because not not going too back back and forth, but rule of religion really works better like this. And then I'll go back to the, to the rule of wealth. When you have the rule of religion and you have the capacity to look bigger than just one religious thought, you have the ability to now sway government. And, and two easy scenarios, one modern and one not so modern. Martin Luther King used the rule of religion to invite other religious leaders to support his civil rights movement. And so the rule of religion trumped the rule of law. That's why I put it first, right? The rule of religion changed the rule of law because there was no law. There was no civil rights laws that helped black people in America. So he used the rule of religion first. He affected the rule of law. Then comes again, the rule of wealth. And the second example I was using, um, 
in respect to the rule of uh, religion was many religious leaders put out um, exemption letters to their constituents for COVID-19 and said, listen, uh, my constituents are not getting vaccinated. And this is why this is our religious realism. Workforces, many workforces looked at the, these letters and we don't accept your letter. And um, they didn't accept letters that came from small religious organizations. If your religious organization was small, they didn't accept it. If your religious organization was powerful, big, had a voice that was international, they accepted it. They said, these religious organizations, they all have the same voice. They all say the same thing. And then we have no choice but to accept it. But if your religious organization was either small or either said multiple different things, which meant that they were not united, they threw those letters out. The rule of religion only works if everybody says the same thing. I just want to break that down. Let me go. After you have the rule of wealth, you have also the rule of force. Because I said, the guy with the money can really control the guy with the gun. The rule of force is our army is bigger than your army, and therefore, you got to do what we say. Why does the United States of what is the United States of America's currency backed by? What is the American dollar backed by? What backs up the American dollar? Is it oil? Is it gold? Are they on a gold standard? Is it silver? Hmm? Is it some other mineral that sits in America that none of us know? <clears throat> no. The American economy is backed by force force the american economy is is the currency the true currency of america is force mm -hmm. it was the same currency of the roman government of the roman empire it was the currency of force the currency of force dictates what most of the world will do we are stronger than you. You will do as we say. We are, we, they, they don't call it the rule of force. They call it foreign policy. And foreign policy and domestic policy are different. Foreign policy is what we're going to do to you if you mess with us. Domestic policy is how we're going to accommodate you within our domestic environment. How are you going to flow with us, within our national infrastructure? Foreign policy is mess with us. This is what's going to happen to you. Work with us. This is what we're going to give you. Don't work with us. This is what we're going to do to you. I call it the rule of force. The rule of force, again, most of us do not operate in a position to, to activate the rule of force on a macro level unless we're organized. Here come the trucker convoy. The trucker convoy, we're operating under the rule of force. Mm -hmm. Now, but we saw what took place with the Crocker convoy. The rule of force shut Canada down for a minute, changed stuff for a minute. Mm -hmm. They shut borders down. They took their big old trucks and they said, we're parking here or not moving. Or oh, you don't want to give us gas? No problem. We'll still sit here. You can't move us. You can't move us because the, even the trucks that are big enough to tow us, they're with us. So you, nothing is going to move. And so what did the government do? They activated the rule of law like never before. They said, oh, yeah, you're going to just try to use the rule of force. You don't understand that we have the rule of law and you are also subject to the rule of wealth. We're going to go in to reach into your bank accounts and freeze all the money. What? Yep, we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to go and, and start taking your property away from you. What? You can do that? Yes, because I have the rule of law. I will make a law to say that if you are here, I now take your home. I now take your property. Wait, wait, what about due process? Due process doesn't matter. Judge's order? A judge's order becomes a rule of law. But I don't need due process without the government. Right? That's what took place. In Canada, for those from some of you who don't know what I'm talking about, they went 
the government, the federal government decided that they were going to lock up those truckers who were blocking, blocking, who were blocking uh, uh, the, the borders and the capital, right? They initiated the rule of law. The rule of law didn't work fast enough. They initiated the rule of force. So they physically started arresting people and they went back to the rule of law. They said, we're going to, we're going to punitively penalize you in perpetual. We're going to make sure that we now take money from you. We're going to freeze money. We're going to make sure that we freeze your licenses. We freeze your, your CVR, the, the, the capacity that CVOR that makes trucks licensable. We're going to, we're going to take, we're going to strip you of all the things that allow you to have a, a, li a livelihood. Wait a minute. But I thought we were allowed to have a peaceful protest in this country. <laughs> That's what you thought. That's what you thought. Peaceful protest. You can only protest if I allow you to protest, my friend. Do you have a permit to protest? Do you have a permit to walk? Do you have a permit to park your car here because you're protesting? No, no, no. I deal with the rule of law. You're just, you're just, you're, just, you're on a smaller level. Your little force isn't going to affect me for long. And this is why force turns into revolution. This is why. Because force can help you to a point until people activate the rule of law on you. And then they can now initiate force themselves. So your force has to be greater than their force or the force that you have ain't going to work. This is why they say, may the force be with you. <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm Obi-Del Kenobi, baby. May the force be with you. Let me explain something to you about the rule of force. I love this because this is where most of us can live. Do you know how the Italians, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Irish, the Jews controlled stuff with the rule of force? Two things, labor parties and organized crime, mafia, yakuza, okay, and other, you know, the, the IRA, and all these, all these biker gangs, they say, hold on a second now, uh, we can't control law, and we're not rich, we sure ain't religious. What are we going to do? We're going to organize. We're going to organize. Uh, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to make sure hmm, that we are the only people allowed to collect the garbage. What? Mm-hmm. Everybody has garbage, right? Rich people got garbage. Government's got garbage. Yeah, that's true. Good. We're going to control the garbage. We're going to make sure that the only people able to collect garbage come from our group. Really? What's that called? A union. Now, who don't like that? People who dealing with the rule of law. For those who are, are, are students of history, most unions very early were considered to be communist organizations. Right? The lawmakers were like, no, 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 no. That's not part of our... That's not part of our system of, of how we want to operate here in the West. That's communism. You can't tell us that we can't exploit you. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you can't tell us that, that that you can control anything here. You're telling us that you are going to come from the bottom and control? Yes, we are. We're going to control the working man. And no working man will work for you unless you pay us this much. And anybody who dares cross that that line and allows that man to pay you less than that, you're a you're a <clears throat> you're a scab. They call them scab. Those guys that would work when the when the unions were were uh, they, it's, I call it revolution, but they call it striking. When the root when the unions declared revolution and you walked across the picket line, called a scab worker boy. They fight you. They hated you because you were breaking their organization of the rule of force. And so the rule of force can work on the everyday guy's level. The trucker showed you. The trucker convoy demonstrated to you that, hey, we do have power. 
And there's more of us little people than there are of those guys. We do have the capacity to organize, but sometimes you don't have the mentality to do it. You can do it, but you don't have the, the, the leadership to do it. You don't have a leader who hasn't been bought off by the rule of wealth already. You don't have a guy on your level with the ability to be charismatic enough or a lady on your level with the ability to be charismatic enough to bring you all together and to let you know, hey, there is a dictatorship. They are controlling you, but I've got a way out of it, right? Currently, Canada has a chance to, to do this. Her name is Dr. Leslie and Lewis. They allow that lady to run the country. She can break this whole thing up. She's, she's the most dangerous woman in Canada right now because she's smart enough to lead, to lead it. And she's common enough to still have the touch of the people. And so she's very dangerous because she's brilliant and she sees all of the things that these dictators have done to keep you in your place. She's a very dangerous lady to the status quo, but she's, she's a common man's hero. I suggest you stand behind her, Dr. Leslie and Lewis, put her in position, overthrow that dictator that you got there named Trudeau. And you probably got a chance to, to flip this thing over. But if you don't do that, oh, you've got to activate the rule of force in some areas. You've got to organize on a grassroots level and put yourself together and say, we the people will not allow it. We the people will stand against it. We the people will not put up with it. And you have the right to do that here in Canada. Now in Africa, they call the military on you. But here you can actually do it. Let me go further. You also have, after the rule of force, and this is one of the other things that people don't understand, is the rule of process. And the, and the rule of process, um, I, I, li I, like to put it, I like to put it in this way, is that you can structurally, you need, a, you need a great mind to do this. You can put together some things structurally that will put you in a position of power, but you need to have patience because it's a process. It's a process of building towards it. And you have to have the foresight to understand it and to see it. Uh, I got a couple examples. So th this is where your real estate moguls live, right? The rule of process for some people was you bought property in farmland in, in this particular area of the world. And when they brought the farmland, they said to themselves, I know that civilization is eventually gonna arrive here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy up everything cheap in my area and wait for them to come to me. You got to have a mind for that. I'm going to wait and, and then I'm not going to sell it in large increments. I'm going to sell it piece by 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 piece and make millions of dollars, or not more. The rule of process. Currently, right now, many of you in North America, especially Canada, Toronto, I'm going to use Toronto. I was going down um, Young and Steel. So now I was showing people. Look at these homes in the Young and Steel's area. And I was seeing a bungalow. And right next to the bungalow was a mansion, a, a three-story mansion that was built, a house that was just built. What was taking place? Was the individuals who bought those houses that were built in the 50s, and they sat on them, they're generational. Now they said, you know what? We can do two things. We can, we can sell and we can go live somewhere else. But they realized, whoa, if you do that, that house is going to be worth two, three million dollars. So why don't I do this? I can take a half a million dollars out of my house, tear it down, and build it back to look like that. This 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 mansion. The rule of process. That's what people have done. People have said to themselves, "You know what? I'm going to stay in the home that I currently am, and I'm going to renovate it, and I'm going to increase the value of it, and then I'm going to wait." until somebody buys this at an, at an, at an enormous amount of life, as opposed to me go and buy another property with basically everything that I sell this property for, I'm going to construct something that, that changes the, the marketplace. There's houses at Young and Steel's that are going for now, they're asking $3 million, $3 million. Now, it's a pretty house. It's about 2,000 square feet, $3 million, though. $3 million. This, no, no, it's not Rosedale. It's not... It's not those nice, nice areas. It's no, no, no. It's Young and Steel's. 
but these houses are going for $3 million because what they have done in their communities is people have just tore down, built back magnificent homes, and then said, okay, we'll put it up for sale now. Rule of process. And again, people who understand these things are people who work well in business. I saw a young girl. She's uh, 17. At 11, black girl, young black girl. At 11, she 11? Yeah, she was 11. Uh, she received $11 million for her lemonade recipe. She found her grandmother's re re lemonade, all tattered, her le lemonade uh, recipe, all tattered up. And she started to create a little lemonade stand and created specific a specific type of lemonade. Everybody's like, this is amazing. And she kept the recipe secret. They said she wanted to do this from four years old. And she kept the recipe secret. And she sold her lemonade brand for $11 million. What is that? That's a rule of process. That's understanding that you have something that the world wants and you have to package it properly. You have to put it together. You have to articulate it. You have to allow people to understand it and you have to create a way for them to get to you or get to it. It's a rule of process. You've got to create the process, right? As they used to say, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. The rule of process gets you into the realm of the rule of wealth, right? Now, this is a very interesting run because it, it's basically close to the rule of religion, but it's 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 a little different. And, and it's called the rule of right and wrong. And why why have I this I've I've differentiated it from religion? Because we we are moving towards a non-religious society. We're not moving, we're here. <laughs> we don't live in a religious society in the West at all. The religious people are the fringe. They're the few. I'm a religious person. I don't make up most of the idea, the ideas, the way that people want to live, the way that people want to self-actualize, self-identify. I don't represent most of that. Most of current day, modern, secular ideas, they don't really resonate with who I am because I have old school traditional religious values. That's just who I am. So therefore, people who are now non-religious simply need a very basic framework to live. They need the rule of right and wrong. And what is the rule of right and wrong? Okay. The rule of right and wrong now is where they're trying to teach you, give you equity. They're having equity meetings with you and they're telling you, listen, when you talk to this person, this person identifies by this particular pronoun and it's not right to identify them as you want. You have to identify them within their pronoun. You have to, you have to recognize that there's alternatives in life and people have alternative opinions and alternative perspectives and alternative. And you have to know the politically correct way to, to navigate through those environments. And therefore, you need to understand the rule of right and wrong. And the rule of right and wrong is subject to change at any given day. They used to be, they, and I'll give you an example for within my community <clears throat> of rule of right and wrong, right? You, you could call them niggers at one time, hard R. Then, then, you, then you could call them Negroes. Then you could call them colored. Then you, you're allowed to call them black. And Jesse Jackson showed up and said, no, we're not any of those, we're African-Americans. And, and so what took place in the process of trying to figure out what we will identify these Africans who we stole from various African countries who now don't have a baseline of their true ethnicity, language, culture, language, you know, sorry, language, culture, religion, creed, history, ancestry. We have to allow them to call themselves what they want. We know what they are. They're just slaves that we, that, that, ha, that we have emancipated. But now we have to be politically correct and allow them to do what they like. You know, we got to let them do what they like. They're angry. Some of them are angry. You know, we realize we have white privilege. Yeah. So we got to let them. Yes, we know. We know we didn't treat you well. We got to treat you better. And 
It's now the rule of right and wrong, right? What would you like me to call you? Okay, that's fine. And, and, and that's where we are right now. And right is whatever people say it is now. Wrong is whatever people say it is now. Because really, in the rule of right and wrong, there really is no right and wrong because it's not really an ideology. It's just what people want. This is what we're gonna do here now. This is gonna change. This is how we're gonna address things. And so the rule of right and wrong even works within um, the marketplace. Corporate, corporate strategy simply changes. Corporate identity simply changes. When the Facebooks and the Googles came around, they said, oh, forget about an Apple. Forget about these suits. And we want to we want a very relaxed environment. You know, you're going to come to work every day. We've got video games. And we, like, it changed. The workplace changed. Everything changed. Everything that used to be right was wrong. And everything that was that, that we considered wrong, now that's right. Change, completely changed. Even in churches. Most churches now operate under the rule of right and wrong. Oh, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't worry about suits and clothing. Just come as you are, you know. And so the pastors, you know, they got tattoos on their faces, or, or and, you know, they they're 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 wearing biker outfits, and or or they're just doing everything because there's no right and wrong anymore. So the rule of right and wrong is allowing society to say we will tell you what is right and we will tell you what is wrong for us. And that will change every day. And if you don't play with the rules of rule and right and wrong, they will cancel you. They had the cancel culture. They had the Me Too movement. They had all these different things, right? They, 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 the LGD, LGBTQ community, right? They, they are very vocal. You, you don't, you don't support us. You don't, you don't recognize us. What are you going to do for us currently in Toronto? Not currently, but when I was thinking about it, but going to a teacher's college, um, the OISE had a particular um, solid premise that you had to come and identify what you were going to do for, for, the, for the gay community. What, what were you going to articulate? How were you going to represent um, the gay community as an educator? And so that was part of even getting access, which is the next one the rule of access. After the rule of process, we have the rule of access. And the rule of access is you, sorry, after the rule of right and wrong, we have the rule of access. You have no access unless you follow the rule of right and wrong. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm educated. It doesn't matter. What, what are you going to say? We, know, we need to know what you have to say about this issue. All right? Currently, politics operates based on the rule of right and wrong and the rule of access. What's your position on abortion? Go ahead and talk, tell us. Based on what they answer, based on what that person answers will determine whether or not they have access. And we have split up into political parties based on the rules of right and wrong of all of our various uh, religious or ethical silos. And we have predetermined that you have no access to this unless you answer the rule of right and wrong property. The rule of access used to simply be based on color, right? Nepotism. Now it's not that. Now it's based on what set do you claim? They used to say that back in the day. What gang do you belong to? What my mindset of right or wrong do you levitate to? Are you liberal? Are you, are you NDP? Um, are, you, are you Democrat? Are you Republican? Are you conservative? Right. So the, the rule of access is basically who can vouch for you, who's already in, who can pull you in because you can't get access from the outside. You only can get access from the inside. Everybody goes to a nightclub knows that. Right. Everybody's trying to get get in free. You got to know somebody. Got to know somebody in there already who can pull you in. The rule of access is do you have enough juice to be identified as somebody who should be pulled in? Or do you know somebody who's already in, who's already made a way for you and pulled you in? The rule of access is powerful because it allows people who are on the in to shut the door on people who are out. And also it allows people who are in to bring in more like them, right? So this is what we're seeing with immigration laws here in Canada. 
immigration laws in Canada operate under the rule of access, meaning everybody that applies for immigration to Canada, whether you want to visit, whether you want to live here, it's not based on the metrics of what you put on your application at all. No, 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 no. We in Canada are choosing who we want. Same thing in America, but in Canada, we want, oh, the Ukrainians, you guys can come. You Africans, no, we don't want you. Syrians, y'all can come, right? So you're making up, they're making up their mind, not based on this, he's African, he's a scientist. He's, 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 got, he's got land in Africa. He wants to come here for two weeks. No, sorry. They're Ukrainian refugees. They don't have any money. They don't have anything. They, 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 oh, come on in. They're Syrians. They don't have any, come on in. So we have a very specific way in Canada how we allow people to access this place, right? It's based on who's sitting in the chair, <laughs> who's sitting in the big chair telling you, telling the, the, the rule of law, who's, who's sitting, who's governing over that saying, yeah, we want these countries, we don't want those countries. Let all those guys in. Rule of access, me moving right along. I wonder if I want to do which which one I was going to do this first. I know which one I'm doing last. I'll do this one. Yeah, the rule of media. Because media controls what you think. If I control the media, I control what you think. If I can control the media, I can control what you think because I can control what you see, what you hear. For the most part, it's very strange. I took my daughters to a um, place that I'm working. And in the basement, in the underground where the Drake Hotel, <clears throat> there was a, a rapper who was basically doing a sound check and he was, and he was rapping. And uh, I watched my children respond to this man who is, was in a position for their level of influence. He had a mic in his hand, he had people around him, and he was rapping, he was saying things, and then he was doing a mock interview and to me, he said nothing of consequence, nothing. I didn't have anything. He, he gave me nothing. I, I was interested in nothing he had to say. I saw the cap. I realized that this is a guy trying to be a guy. He ain't nobody yet. But to my daughters, they turned to me and said, Dad, he's cool. Right? Dad, he's cool. My, my, my little screw face 15-year-old was like smiling, like listening to what you're saying, kind of laughing. I was like, hmm, very interesting. Very, very interesting, right? The rule of media. The person who has the mic, the person who has the bully pulpit can plant thoughts in your mind like a farmer can plant a garden, can, can plant ideologies, can sway you, right? They can sway you with, with rap music, they can sway you with a song. They can sway you with CNN and Fox News. They can they can sway you with making movies about this or, sh or short skits. They can sway you with a meme. They can sway you with how your body's supposed to look and how much makeup you're supposed to have on. They can sway you with fashion. They can sway you with a level of lifestyle. They can show you, oh, you're not living if you're not on a vacation like we are. Look at us. We're on vacation. We're doing this. We're in Dubai. We're on a beach. We're on a boat. We're popping bottles. We're in the club and people are walking up to us. We're doing bottle service. Oh my gosh, we're buying $400 bottles. Or $20 in the liquor store. But we, we're living life. What are you doing? So media looks at, makes media makes you say, "Wow, what am I doing, man? I'm not I'm not living the life I'm supposed to live, man. Look at Brenton; he's got a new hat on every day. I need some I need some hats, man. I need some I need some tattoos, bro. I I need I need a nose ring. I I need I need to do something. I need to do I need to change. I need to be better. I you know. Media starts to talk to you. Starts to tell you what you're not. Starts to tell you what to believe. Starts to tell you who you are." Manifesto of power says, if you control the media, you control their minds. You control their minds. I don't have to tell you that. Most of you know that already. I'm gonna give you my two last ones and I'm gonna let you go. And I'll, I'll, do, a, I'll do a quick summary so you have it all. The next one 
is a big one. It's the second to last one. It's the rule of distraction. Many of you know this one too. And, and some people have, have, have identified it, have pointed it out, of you know, of saying things like, wait a minute, how come we're not talking about this anymore because this came? Isn't it interesting that all of a sudden, for example, um, the flu doesn't exist anymore, the flu shot doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> influenza doesn't exist anymore. Those, those things don't even exist anymore. It's about COVID now. So the rule of distraction is allow is allows certain things to go under the radar, right? While you're here looking at something else, right? When they're killing people in Darfur and, and they're enslaving people in Libya, right? Whoosh, something else comes up on the horizon. And all of a sudden, all the attention is off of that and it's over here, right? All of a sudden, it's something else to focus on because they need to make sure they and the days, there's always the days, huh? The days, the days, who are these days? There's a lot of days, but they need to make sure that they can push this particular agenda while you're looking over here. Well, I don't get caught up in the rule of distraction. I don't get distracted. That's not true. That's not true. You people who don't vote, I bet you you, you watch you watch basketball all you bet you, you didn't get to take your eyes off the NBA. Didn't take your eyes off bunch of black men trying to win a brass gold trophy, right? You're in your groups. All you talk about is these guys all the time, all the time. Who's best? Is it LBJ? Is it is it is it Jordan? Whose era is it? Is the era of, of, of Steph Curry? And you guys are going back and forth, distracted. And then after that, whoosh, here comes baseball season. After that, whoosh, hockey season. And this starts all over again, right? Next movie's coming out. Drake, Drake dropped a new album. Drake's new album is dropping. Oh, Drake's album's terrible. Oh, Lori is breaking up with Michael B. Jordan. And whoosh, 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 whoosh. While the world is passing by, while people are, are slipping in policies, while people are changing the way that you will operate, the way that you live, but you're being distracted. You're being distracted. And also, Credit is a distraction. The power of credit, oh my God, listen. How do you make a man work his entire life and never complain? Make him, give him stuff that he likes. Like what? Let him buy a new car every year. Give him new credit. What? Yeah, let him buy that nice car that he wants. So he can drive home from work. That he's going to work for the rest of his life in a nice new car. Hey, that's a good idea. Give him a bigger house with a swimming pool and, and all the stuff in it. So he says, looks around and says, yeah, man, I'm going to keep working so I can keep this stuff around, man. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing this. Distract him with consumer goods, right? Amazon. Phew, man, I, got, I, I'm, I can't lie. I've got an Amazon addiction. I, every time I see a little spirit, I'm like, oh, boy, I want to buy this. I, I see that. I see this. Give him access, easier access to getting his stuff faster. Doesn't have to, he doesn't have to save up for it, right? You can just get it. Wow. They can just, I can just get anything. Yeah, get it all, man. Like I said to you uh, a few weeks ago, people arriving from the Ukraine, they're, they're, they're allowing them to get credit. They have instant credit. Instantaneously, they have credit. You could be here your whole life and not be able to get a gold card. They can get off the plane with a gold card. Students, boom, two gold cards. Wow. Because they want them to say, no, no, we want to plug you in so that you feel that you're going to work for the rest of your life for us. Come on, give her more, give her more. Make her have to continue to earn this. Make her have to make him have to continue to keep this going. Distraction. Credit is a distraction. Consumer goods is a distraction. Most of the things that you have are basically distractions. Netflix is a distraction. Prime video distraction. Disney, all those are distractions because it allows you to continually go through the process of not looking at what is actually happening in your nation as they take your rights away, as they take your freedoms away, as they change laws to work against you, to keep you in your place, as they tell you you can't travel, you have no access to this, you can't leave the country. Distractions. And they trust me, they don't want you in jail. They, 
one thing we have figured out in Canada is that jail is that's a bad investment. Keeping a keeping a full grown slave in jail. <laughs> America, at least they figured out, listen, we're, at least, if we're going to put these people in jail, let's make some money off of it. So they have they have privatized prison systems. The, the people are actually making money by putting you in jail. That's why they got so many people incarcerated. They have more people incarcerated than anybody in the world. America has more people incarcerated than I believe all the countries in the world combined because it's a money-making system. They, they started their country on slavery. It's a slave system. They've extended it to other ways, but you've been distracted. You're watching LeBron James shoot hoops while there's a hundred thousand black men in prison who look just like LeBron James who are in there and are probably innocent, who are in there because systems have put them in there, as well as there's millions of them in the ground because the rule of law has walked all over them. But you're walking, you're watching a guy shoot jump shots. Last but not least, after the rule of distraction, this is the one that we need to operate in. There's the rule of change. And the rule of change is the rule that we create. That rule has no specific tenets. No, there's, there's no manifesto to that because one thing that you know, change will happen. Change will take place. Change will come. And change is in the hands of the individual who has the mindset of the order of the strong to bring about change. Are you an agent of change? Because change is going to happen to you, whether you're an agent of change or whether you are an individual who is subject to be changed, change will happen to you. You will change from healthy to sick to dying. You will change from, from powerless to powerful. You will change from poor to rich or from rich to poor. You will change from employed to unemployed or from unemployed to employed. You will change from single to married. You will change that is the guarantee of life. The guarantee of life is that everything changes. The question is, are you going to control the change or will the change control you? Mm. Will you unify to pull change under su submission of your will or will change change you? That's the question. That is the question. The rule of change is guaranteed. Everything will change, but will you control the change? Will you sit and look at your brothers and say, bro, let's control this change together. This thing's not gonna, this thing's not gonna work for us unless we make it work for us. This thing's not gonna bless us unless we put a stranglehold on it and say, I will not let you go till it blesses me. Change, man. Change is not a joke. Change is going to happen, but can you control it? Change is, is, is like a tidal wave coming in your direction. But what are you doing? Are you waiting to drown? Or are, you, are you building a surfboard? Are you building an ark? Are you building a helicopter to fly above it? What are you doing? Because change is coming. But you know what to do with the change. I'm going, to, I'm going to break these down as I call, as I said them. The order of the strong, the manifesto of power. Okay, I would like us to become part of the order of the strong. Those who want to stand with me, stand with me. We can we can pull it together. It starts with who do we put in Ottawa in this country and in around the world. It starts with how do we unite ourselves to make sure that we are stronger in the things that are stronger than us today. But the rule of law, the rule of force, the rule of right and wrong, the rule of wealth, the rule of process the rule of access, the rule of distraction, the rule of media, the rule of religion, and the rule of change. Those are your 10 items of the manifesto of power. I am part of the order of the strong, period. What are you part of?